So a spherical mirror is to be used to form on a screen 5.0 meter from the object an image five times the size of the object. A. Describe the type of mirror required. B. Where should the mirror be positioned relative to the object? And C. Determine the focal length of the mirror. Okay. You need to understand the question. A spectral mirror is used to form on a screen. So once the image formed, okay, is on a screen, then it means the image must be um real. The image must be real because real images are formed on a screen. Okay. If the image is to be formed and so will be real, do not forget that the other mirror, which is convex, does not form real images. It always would give you um, virtual images. So when the image is to be formed on a screen, then the, the type of mirror to be used or required must be concave or converging mirror. Please, is that part understood? Is it understood? Yes, please. Now back to where should the mirror be positioned relative to the object? What do you think is the question here? Where should the mirror be positioned relative to the object? What's the question here? Can what somebody should... share? Uh -huh. Also, also okay. another in order that um, the image times the object. Uh, but what is the question? How do you understand this question? Where should the mirror be positioned relative to the object? Which letter are we to calculate for here? Anybody can answer. You. You. Is the object this time? Where should the mirror be positioned relative to the object? So let's draw the whole question into drawing. So a screen is here. A screen is here. We can realize. A uh, concave mirror is to be used. There is an object. Oh, in the screen. So, a spherical mirror is to be used to form on a screen 5.0 meter from the object. So, it means that the screen is like a distance of 5.0 meter from the object. So the five meter given is the distance between the objects and the screen. A lot of you do this as object distance. So this distance is five meter. The distance from the object to the mirror is you. This distance from the mirror to the where the image is SV. So it means that U plus V must be equal to five meters. Equation one. The other information is that. We are told that the image formed on the screen is five times the size of the object. So the linear magnification, the magnitude of the linear magnification is equal to five. Therefore, knowing M to be equal to V on U, 
we form another equation. And that is 5 is equal to V on U. Since M equals if, um, image distance to my object distance. Therefore, from this equation two, image distance V is equal to I times and so if the distance is equal to five times this, then we can substitute this into equation one. Okay, so it's just a simple question, but I don't I don't know how some of you were looking at it. Maybe you thought so much. So we have u plus v which is equal to five and u plus I u is equal to five. Therefore, six u is equal to five. Then you find u five and six, which must be zero point zero point. Calculate it for me, please. East is six three. 0 0.833 Karen. Okay. So 0 0.833. Okay. And what is in meter? Let's quickly change this to centimeter. Even though it's not so necessary, but let's quickly change this to centimeter. What will be 8 point, 0 0.833 in centimeter? Quick one, quick one. Eight point three 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 in centimeter. Oh, who is answering? So when you multiply two by hundred, you have it. So what this is what the question required. Calculate the um where should the mirror be positioned relative to the object? So this is the object distance u. Okay, then determine the focal length of the mirror. Once once u is the V will be equal to zero point eight three three. 5 times 0 0 0.833. 4.165. 4.165. 165. Change that to change that to centimeter for me. 416.5 centimeters. That's it. So one on you plus one on me. Therefore this is U plus V times U V is one on you. Therefore, be equal to u v over u plus v, and r u is three point eight v is four point six five over three three plus. Oh, one, three, five. So calculate that for me. Multiply the numerator, the denominator, then you divide the numerator by the denominator.
Sixty-nine. Let's confirm. Point four centimeters. Somebody to confirm that for me. Is it confirmed? Yes, please. Okay. All right. So that's it. That's, it was a simple question. So, in fact, I was quite surprised. Only a few of you were able to get this right. Any question? Any question? Okay. All right. Then let's look at determine the focal length of a cap or spherical mirror. Do I clean the board or some of you are writing? Do I clean the board? All right. Once there is absolute silence, it means I can clean it. Gabriel, are you here? Gabriel Vedu. So determining the focal of a camera. Mirrors or curved mirrors are, are identified using two things. One, we can identify them by their shape, whether the reflecting surface is curved in or curved out. So curved mirrors Are identified using okay using their shape when the reflecting surface curves in inwardly it is concave when it curves outwardly it is convex. Apart from, so here, when you are going to buy, okay, um, curved mirror, they will ask, which one do you want? Is it convex or concave? And as a disciple of physics, when you are given one, you must be able to identify that this is concave or convex. So in buying it, you use the shape of the reflecting surface to decide. The second thing that is used to identify mirrors is their focal length. So you can also, apart from this, you can also use a focal length because different curved mirrors, okay, have different uh, focal length. So I'm buying a mirror. Is it concave or convex? Then the next question is that, 
what what focal length do you want? Oh, I want uh, a curved mirror of focal length, maybe five centimeter, 10 centimeter, and so on and so forth. Just last Wednesday, our form threes had physics of key particles. And one of the questions is about mirrors. We were to, I mean, by um, concave mirror of focal length 15 centimeter or 20 centimeter. So we had to go to the market to buy concave mirror of these two focal lengths. Okay. So as a first person, if you are given um, a curved mirror and you are asked to determine, use your knowledge to determine the focal length of the mirror in question, how do you do that? And that, so that's the whole essence of determining the focal length of a spherical mirror. Please, are you are you okay? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. There are two. There are two quick methods of doing that. Okay. Using one, it can be done. The focal length can be determined using approximate. The first method is using approximate method. Approximate method. And then the, the other method that can be used is graphical method. Graphical method. So we have the approximate method and then the graphical method. How do we use the, uh, the approximate method? The approximate method is a quick way of determining the focal length. Very quick. And the graphical method, the name is clear. You use graph. You plot information on a graph sheet to determine it. What is this approximate method? When an object, when an object is placed at infinity, in place uh, in front of a concave mirror, where is the image formed? Yes. When an object this is a concave mirror. There is a focal length, a uh, principal focal f. Of course, this the principal axis divides it to a point known as p. This is this is c. So when the object is placed at infinity, where is the image formed? Yes. I need um, a response from any of you. When the object is placed at infinity, where is the image formed? Please at F. The image is formed at F. Thank you, Erifua. So, in using this method, what we do is that a mirror is put in place, then An object here we place we represent the object or we try to incident light from an object afar. Okay, that must not be so close to the mirror, but it must be at a distance. So in laboratory, we we pick rays from the rivers around all. A nearby tree around the lab. We don't want an object raised from an object close. This is because we know that when when an object is at infinity, and infinity can be any distance beyond C. So we assume that okay, the object must must be a bit far. And when the object 
is a bit far, then it is close to being at infinity. So if this is the mirror, we try to pick rays from objects afar, the river blade, then all the kids around. And then move a screen. Okay, at the side of the mirror. So the mirror is put in um, a mirror holder. This is a mirror holder. Then we place a screen close to directly, okay, along the principal axis because mirrors reflect. But we place it either here and then move it back and forth because the light from a distant object, maybe three, a tree around, what incidents on the mirror, okay, and then the mirror then reflects the incident ray. So all that we are doing is that we want to force light from this tree all over. And so by moving the screen back and forth, you can get a very sharp image of this tree or the louvers. If um, you would focus the image of this tree on the screen, so if I move it front and back, and the, and the image is sharp enough, then the distance between the mirror and then the image formed on the screen becomes the focal length. And when this is done right, because the tree must be at a distance position, we assume that the ray coming from the tree is from infinity because it is so far beyond T. Okay, so this distance from the mirror to the image becomes the focal length of the mirror. Okay, so the atomic method is a quick method of determining the focal length of a mirror. It isn't so precise or accurate because, because that's why we determine it approximate because of uh, not knowing the exact position of this, but we are assuming that once the object is far as infinity, so the distance from the mirror to the screen becomes the focal length of the mirror. Please, are you okay? Flat, are you okay? Yes, yes please. Yes, sir. All right. Then let's look at the graphical method. So after this, in a lab, you will, you, you will be doing it so quick. Try to uh, focus, okay, rays from a distant object. And then have a screen, okay, to capture the image of the distant object. Okay, so by moving the screen back and forth around, around the mirror, you can get a sharp image of it. Okay, and then the screen between the screen and then the mirror. Okay, in this method, you cannot place the screen behind. This is because this is a coated area. This part is coated. Coating it makes the, the mirror opaque. So rays cannot just pass through. The reason for which the screen must be placed at the side, an angle to it, either the side or the side, to get the image. All right. The graphical method. As for the graphical method, you will plot it on a graph. And I'm sure when you go to school, you do that experiment. An experiment to determine the focal length of a curved mirror. And usually we use the function. Okay, and then the convex we don't. The reason is that for convex, the image cannot be captured on a screen. So Capturing the image is a problem. The reason for which we are always using the curved mirror. So the graphical method. The graphical method uses 
So the mirror steps within like the before. The concave mirror. This is the mirror holder. We place an object in front of it. We place an object in front of the mirror. Usually, what we have here is an illuminated object. The name sounds so big, but it isn't anything so, so um, important. What is the illuminated object? This is just like the money box. Within the money box, we have a bulb. So bulb, incandescent bulb, is put into it. This is connected to a source of electricity. Then a hole, like the pinhole camera. There is a hole created, okay, at the middle. Then we have wire mesh covered around this part. Wire mesh. So that when the bulb lights up, okay, the rays will just pass through it because when the rays pass through the wire mesh, this shape of the wire mesh becomes the object. So the object is actually this, the wire mesh. That will covered with the wire mesh becomes the object. Okay, so when the bulb is on, we have light rays coming from the object, which is the wire mesh. But here I'm picking two light rays coming from the hole covered with wire mesh. Then, because mirrors reflect, we keep a screen here. We keep a screen at the side of it so that when the rays incident on the mirror, it will reflect here. and form this image, uh, the image of this object on the screen. So you see the image of this wire mesh formed on the screen. The screen is just a cardboard, uh, plywood that is covered with um, white paper. Okay. Now I can get a clear image when I move the screen place at the side back and forth. So by moving it, okay, forth and back, we want to just focus the image of this on the screen. So what we do is that you'll be giving different objects. So example 20 Please pay attention to mm -hmm. the you because you'll be doing this in five hours. Assuming we are starting with 20 centimeters, 30, 40. All that we are saying is that when the object distance, the distance from the object to the mirror is 20, 20 centimeters, then you move the screen back and forth so you have a sharp image of this captured on the screen. Okay. If you get that, then you measure the image distance, which is this the distance from the from the uh, mirror to the image. For this distance, the image distance B. You measure from here to here and record. Okay. Let's assume that is it. Let's assume that is. Um, this is assuming 
Then you come to the next of the and 30. So you must push the mirror holder because you are measuring a distance of 30 centimeters from the illuminated object. Illuminated object. So after measuring 30, you, not, you need to move the screen forward back so you have a sharp image of this object formed on the screen. Mm -hmm. Then you measure the image distance V again. Let's assume that you measure this at 45. Then you measure the distance you come and measure for 40. So right. all that we are doing is you are varying the object distance and then moving the screen so you have a sharp image of the object formed on the screen. Then the distance between the screen and the lens holder to get V. Class, are you okay? Class, are we okay? Yes, it. Now, now mute yourself. So, it's basically a repetitive something we are doing. A way for ask your question. Please, if you Please have a question to ask, do so. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Please, can you come again with the reason why you're supposed to draw the table over there? You see, no, you understand why? Okay, you have to draw a table. We have object and object distance is given. So we are varying the object distance. If object distance is 20, and that is the distance from the object, illuminated object to the screen, then you move the screen, sorry, that to the mirror. You move the screen so you have sharp image of this formed on the screen. Then you measure the distance from the image to the mirror, and that is V. So we are basically varying the object distance in each situation. Then once you finish, look at this. The reason why we are we are giving you to get V, okay, is that from this relation, the mirror formula, one on F is equal to one on U plus one on V. If you take the LCM of this. And equal to u times v. U goes into this one. As u. Then one on f will be equal to u plus v over u times v. So after changing u to get v within the table, you must have u and v. Then you must also have u plus v like that. Okay. When you finish, you are asked to plot, plot a graph of u plus v on the vertical. And u times v on the horizontal. So graphical method. It means that in plotting your graph, your vertical axis must be u plus v against horizontal axis u times v. And your graph will be a straight line. Your graph will be a straight line, either passing through the origin or... Now, I want you to help me find the slope of the graph. How do we Determine the slope this a graph of u plus v against u v. Can somebody help me? We want the slope of this graph. Anybody? 
anybody to share how we can obtain the slope? Mamiya. I want to ask a different, I want to ask a question. Okay. I don't know answer the question. Sorry. Go ahead. I should ask a question. Yes. I wanted to ask that if the U is 20, does it mean that it's at the 20 and they are shifting the mirror to get an image? Will it still be at the 20 while they are shifting or the, when they are shifting it, the 20 will change? I mean, we are keeping, you see, all that we are doing is that we are giving, keeping the distance between the object and the mirror constant, but we need to move the screen so we have sharp image of this object come on the screen. So for each U, this distance must be kept constant. All that you need to do is moving the screen so you have a sharp image of the object formed on the screen. Then you measure the distance between the screen and the mirror. Are you okay? Yes, because I understand it now. Thank you so much. So what's the question? We are determining the slope of the we are finding the slope of a graph of u against u, uh, u plus v against u. The guys, let me hear from you too. Mami, I'm waiting for you. What is the slope? How do we determine the slope or the gradient of such a graph? Okay, go ahead, Mami. Amiya, go ahead. Hey, if you have a graph of y against x, how do you find the slope? Uh -huh. Please stay there. Hello. Please, I think the change in uv over, no, change in u plus v over change in uv. So, it is changing. U plus V over and V. So all that has to be done here is that you pick two points on the graph. Find the change in the vertical in, in linear motion, acceleration, velocity, change. change in the vertical, which is U plus V against change in the horizontal, which is U times V. So that will be the slope. Now compare all what you need to this equation. Where we have one on F is equal to U plus V over U times V. When you compare, you could easily um, that then one on F must be equal to the slope. Please, is it understood? Class, is that understood? Yes, please. So, one on F is equal to the slope, meaning that if you go through this, process, when you, you manage to determine the slope, you can easily find F. But you think this slope gave by a value of Zero point one centimeter. I'm assuming that when plotted, we had a slope as to be equal to zero point one zero centimeter. If the slope is the same, one on F is equal to zero point one zero. So the result of this make up the subject mean. Out of what we have, make F the subject. Make F the subject out of what we have here. Yes, quick one, quick one. Leona, talk. Mami, I talk. Eva. Uh, Dela. F will be equal to 10. F here will be equal to 10. Meaning that the focal length of the mirror is. 10 centimeter. 
So we are using the graphical method to determine the focal length of the mirror. So simple. Please, is it understood? Nathaniel, the last... So this is one way of using the graphical method to find the focal length. Now, I want you to think and tell me something. If the gap is not u plus v again, u times v, but we have this. But we have u times v again, u plus v. The vertical is u plus v. Then the horizontal is u plus v. How do we find the focal length of the mirror? If the, um, the axis, okay, are changed, the vertical is u times v, the horizontal is u plus uh, v, how do we find the focal length f of the mirror? Thank you. Whilst I take a shot of attendance, it has to be uploaded. So please think to, I'll call one of you to give me an answer. Rachel, you are here. Nathaniel, you are also here. Everybody is here. Lenny, Aqua. <laughs> if the vertical is y, vertical is uv. The horizontal is u plus v. How do we deduce the focal length of the mirror? I want to take attendance, so please. Give me a few minutes. Yes. How do we determine F if we have this situation? Who is ready? Elizabeth, let me point to you. Elizabeth. Yes, please. How do we find the focal length if we have this situation? Mr. Davis, I'm still, I'm still figuring it out. Hey. <laughs> okay, let me call one of the guys. Um, Nana Safo. Safo, are you there? Safo, I know you are here. How do we find the focal line if we have the situation? Kweku, learning. Oh, who's answer? William, Joel, Yaira. I say, Kwabena, Kelvin, there are lots of you here. Gabby, 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 <laughs> Gabby, you are hiding today. Caleb. Yeah, please, I'm still figuring it out. Okay. Okay, then, Maka, do you have an idea? Mamiya. Yes, do you have an idea? Uh -uh. Change in UV over mm -hmm. change in UV. So, so change in the slope here will be change in UV over change in U plus V. Okay. So if the slope is this. And from what we have, from this equation, from this equation, we have, we have one on F, one on F is equal to U plus V over UV. And how do we determine the focal length. 
Yes, mommy, I saw on you. How do we find F in this case? So if there is a Q for F, it should be the inverse of the equation. So it should become U V over U plus V. So F will be equal to. So in this case. Over U plus V. Uh -huh. So F will be equal to. UV plus V, then F will be equal to when you compare F will be equal to F will be equal to the slope. The slope, the slope is from change in UV over change in U plus V. So they are the same. that the book that I have is equal to the slope in a big situation. Please, is it understood? Is that okay? Yes, yes, please. So, the vertical axis, the horizontal axis can, can be changed. You can be asked to plot UV against U plus V or you can compare it with the equation, the mirror equation, and you are there. So this is one of the Quickly, let's go to the other. Other one is the same arrangement, but this time it's two V and then U plus V. But after determining you, you'll be asked to find one over you, one over V. So these are just calculated values. After going through the experiment to find V, just find the inverse of whatever you value you are given. Find the inverse of the value you have. Then Then you plot a vector in a 2D again, UV on the vertical, and U on the vertical, and then one on the horizontal, or the other way around. So on U on the vertical, against one on V on the horizontal. Find the slope of this. So change one on you, change in one on me. Okay. So slope x is equal to. Delta one on you over delta one on V. Now you think this. You think the mirror formula. One on F is equal to one on U to V. You see over here. Your vertical y is this. Your horizontal x is this. So let's make an equation of straight line, which is y is equal to mx plus c. Let's this is y. Let's make one on you the subject. And the equation one over u will be equal to minus one over v plus one over f. Since this is the case, when you plot this graph, you have a negative product. But from, from my equation, the gradient M is negative one. 
this is this is why one over v is x the gradient m is negative one so the graph will tilt like this okay the graph will tilt like this then m can be determined from what we have done there's no so when you divide one on u by one on v, you must get negative one. Then you see when we compare one over u is y, one over v is x. The intercepts on the vertical axis c must be equal to one on f. Uh, Eva, is that okay? I'm told the line is big. Is it okay to call us blue? Is it better? Hello, is it still breaking? No, no, please. Okay. So, when you cover this question, and then the equation of a straight line. We, that no, then re, can you rejoin? Maybe it's a challenge from your end. Then we can insert on the vector as a C. C must be equal to one over F. Maybe from the graph, when you are able to read C, you can easily find F. Assuming, it means C is 5. 5 is equal to 1 over F. And when you make F the subject, you have 1 over 5. 1 over 5 is equal to the focal length of the mirror. Okay. So this is how to use the graphical focal length of a mirror. Actually, you would understand it better. I think when you go to school and go through what okay you need to do. At the moment, it will look something, but later on, you come. I think you may even call me or come to me to re-explain this to you. And if you are in a different school, you can still find a way out and I'll answer you. Okay. Now, if the graph is one over V. Hello. Please, can you come again? Like the okay. drawing. Let me come again. So, just as we, we have discussed earlier, all that we, are, we are giving different values to you. Okay, we measure the object of the sun. We move the screen so we have a sharp image formed on the screen. Then we measure from the middle to the screen, and that will be V. So when we finish, you command by you one on V, one on V. Then the instruction from the graph may say that. And on then if you yes, yeah, those of you who have done text of practical before, then the question will ask you to find the slope of this graph, then the intercepts on the vertical axis. Those questions we usually ask. So after having one of you, one of you plus. The vertical is one on V. The horizontal is one on U. Okay. Now, when you plot such a graph with your values, you get a negative slope. 
place when you go to school if you haven't fetched the cheetah do so buy it and then go through the test of particles you understand the same better okay now how do we find the slope we determine slope using taking two values here change in vertical change in horizontal so from this our slope would be equal to change in one on v over change in one on u and whatever we get from the slope s would be equal to uh, the gradient of this now how do we use this to find the focal length when you compare one on f is equal to one on u plus one on v the graph is that we plus one on v on the vector and this is y then this is x so let's make we are comparing this is a straight line so we are always comparing it to equation of a straight line y is equal to mx plus c so from this let's make y the subject so we need to make one on v the subject since that is equal to y so from this equation one on v one on v would be equal to minus because that's what minus one on u plus one on f when you compare this equation to y is equal to mx plus c it means that our gradient must be equal to negative one because x is equal to one on u and so the slope the slope as we calculated here it is close to negative one so when you understand this you can predict what you must have as your values okay slope must be equal to something close to negative one from the theory then c in linear equation c is where the graph cut the vertical axis so we term it as intercept on the vertical axis okay so determining where the graph cut the vertical axis from your graph it means that we can equate c to one over f because we are comparing so if i'm able to determine c i can easily find the focal length of the number so let's assume c is a value of 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 0 0.6 whatever it means this is equal to 0 0.1 and from this, when you make F the subject, you have F being equal to 10 meters. It means the focal length of the mirror used in the experiment is equal to 10 centimeters. And we are using the graphical method to find the focal length of a spherical mirror. Please understood. Yes, please. All right. Any question? All right. So this is how to use the approximate method, the graphical method, to determine the focal length of a spherical mirror. OK, when, when we begin lenses, it is also the same method. So once you understand it from mirror's point of view, lenses will just be, be be lensing at your face you just oh okay the same thing all right i want us to look at another property or characteristics of light and that is refraction we've gone through reflection in spherical mirror plain mirrors i've seen all the characteristics Let's look at refraction of light. Refraction of light.
those of you who are advanced readers, can you share with the class what refraction of light is about? What is refraction of light? Anybody to share something with us? If in case you've read around something like that. What is refraction of light? We know reflection to be bouncing of light from a surface and condition that, okay, let Mamiya ask for us and the rest also. Mamiya, what do you think is refraction of light? Refraction of light is the change in the direction of a light ray as it moves from a less dense medium, a more dense medium. Or a more dense medium, a less dense medium. So, Maria is saying that refraction is a change in direction of light as the light moves from a less dense medium to a more dense medium or the other way around. More views. Thank you, Maria, for your view. Maria. Okay, Mami, I'll go ahead. Mami, I'll go ahead. Please, my hand is not up. Yo. Okay, I so, I all right. So, that's the, when we talk about refraction, that is the, but please, it be said in terms of Change in direction of light as it moves from one medium to another, or change in speed. In speed. So either we are saying it in terms of change in direction, change in speed or velocity. As the light moves from one medium into another medium of different density. Then three can also be change in wavelength of light. So I think only about change in direction of light when it uh, um when it it has to move from one medium to another, but it can be any, it can be said in terms of any of these three changes. Are you okay? Class, are you fine? Yes, sir. Yes. Now, the big question is that what causes or brings about this change in any of these three? What causes it for two different media? Or material, what must be what must be for the change in direction or speed or wavelength thing to occur? What must be there? Or conditions necessary for refraction to occur? What must be there? Everybody, for refraction, we saw that the condition must be the light. The nature of the surface of material on which the light incident um, deforms the extent of reflection. If the material is solid, it's different. Leonard, it, my line is breaking. Please, is that a general concern? That my line is breaking. Oh. Please let me hear from the rest of you so that if um yes please. I can restart yes. you lie it's not it's not breaking you lie and I'll climb you a little okay let me quickly change give me a minute to change from the Bluetooth to something else okay all right so you see what causes refraction is that 
In fact, whenever you have one medium, one medium, and light passes through that medium, it can be, this can be air, water, or glass. Any of um, any medium or transparent medium. When light is incidental from the boundary between air and maybe glass, so long as the light passes through the same medium, its path will never change or speed will never change. Direction will never change. So we say that whenever light passes through a homogeneous medium, whenever light passes through a homogeneous medium, homogeneous medium, its direction, its speed, its wavelength doesn't change. What's the meaning of homogeneous medium? For homogeneous medium, we are talking of one same atom medium, meaning a medium with same atoms throughout. Same atoms, molecules, particles. Okay, so, so long as this is glass, air and it is passing through glass or air the path will never change but when the light moves from glass and then comes to air assuming we have air you realize that the light is moving from glass medium into air and the atomic composition of the two are not the same and because of this reason, the path of the light will change. The speed of the light will change. So will be the wavelength, okay? So different particles or me media of different molecular or atomic composition, we term this as heterogeneous medium. Heterogeneous medium, meaning uh, different media of different uh, particle composition or atomic composition. So the concept is that when light passes through a homogeneous medium, its path doesn't change, its direction doesn't change, so is its speed. However, when light is moving through a heterogeneous medium, that is when its direction, speed, or wavelength changes. Class, is that okay? Is that understood? Yes, please. Yes, please. So, so refraction of light is due to the difference in the density of two materials or two different media. So if it's about one medium, nothing will happen. But the moment we, you have two different uh, materials, so this is the boundary between air and water. And we know the density of air is rho subscript A. Density of water rho subscript W. Here, rho of air is less than rho of water, or density of water greater than density of air. So when light is incidented from air, it incident ray, maybe starting from this point, so long as it is passing through air, nothing will happen to the direction nothing will happen to the speed. 
But the moment is enters into another medium, then the path of the light, incident light changes. How will it change when it is moving? This is the normal. So this is the angle of incident. When it is moving from less dense medium to a more dense medium, its path is deviated towards the normal. So this angle becomes the angle of refraction. This time the light is being deviated or refracted. So this angle becomes the angle of refraction. So I is equal to angle of incidence and R is equal to angle of Refraction. This is the incident ray. This is the normal. Then this is the refracted ray. This horizontal line is the boundary between the two media. Okay. So when light moves from a less dense medium into a more dense medium, the refracted ray is bent towards the normal. Please, any question? The refracted ray is bent towards the normal. What do you think will be the relationship between I and R? Would I be greater or less than R? Yes. Greater. Which one will be greater than which one? I will be greater than R. Okay. I will be greater than. Okay. So this deviation is due to the difference in the densities of the two media. So we define refraction as the change in one direction of light as it is propagated from one medium to another of different optical densities. Okay, change in direction or change in speed, or change in wavelength, as it is propagated from one medium into another of different optical densities. There is the use of the adjective optical density because the two media must be such that they allow light to pass through, the reason for which we use optical. All right. So, please, can you repeat the definition? It is the change, refraction is the change in one direction or change in speed or the change in wavelengths. Okay, it can be said in terms of these three phrases I'm giving you. As light is propagated from one medium to another of different optical densities. Meaning for the light to be refracted, the two media must have different optical densities. Okay, so this is similar to even us. You see, when you are running through air, your speed does not change. Okay, imagine um, Cadmill running through air. His speed will be constant. But the moment Cadmill tries to run through pond, a pool of water or a river, because the water is denser compared to air, 
your speed will, will be slowed. So your part, there is a change in your speed, meaning refraction is occurring or happening. So here, either your direction changes, okay, or your speed or wavelength. For this reason, you see, whenever you find yourself in a pool, it is dangerous to slash a machete or knife, hold a knife or machete in a pool of water or in a river and try to um, pass it through the water. Because of the density, it will change the direction of the um, machete before you realize you've injured yourself. So if you've stayed in a, um, a rural area before, that is very, very observable, okay? Now, when light is propagated from here, we are looking at air to water. What about if we change the direction of the incident light? This is the normal. This is water. This is glass. Oh, sorry, air. We have reversed. The part of the incident light is from a dense medium to a less dense medium. How do you think the deviation, when the ray is coming out of the water into air, how will it, how will the ray deviate? Yes. How is the ray going to uh, be deviated when it is? Imagine from water. Anybody? Anybody? How do you think the direction of the ray will deviate when it is being it propagated? Will, it will move away from the normal. Oh, so it will move away from the normal. Thank you. So here, the angle of refraction is far, far greater than the angle of incidence. So I is less than R. And here, I is greater than R. So when light is propagated from a more dense medium into a less dense medium, the refracted ray is deviated away from the normal. And when it is from a less dense medium to a more dense medium. It is deviated towards the normal. These are basics you must understand under refraction of light. Any question? Now, in mirrors, or under mirrors, if this is a horizontal mirror, the normal is drawn we incident light. Mirrors reflect. So the angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection. So this incident ray is supposed to move straight. However, due to its interference with the mirror, it is it part is reflected or deviated. And we are interested in the magnitude of the deviation or reflection, hence angle of deviation. Under mirrors, we said, or we saw that angle of deviation sigma is equal to, yes, what is the expression for angle of deviation in mirrors? Yes, we are recapping. So somebody should quickly tell me. What expression did we make for angle of deviation in mirrors? Anybody? Angle of deviation. Frida. Frida. Hey. Hey, we are revising all. Okay, Mamiya. Mamiya, go ahead. Uh, 
Mr. Dear, please, it's a refer. A refer, go ahead. 180 minus 2i or 180 minus 2r. Thank you very much. So this is the angle of deviation in Anna mirrors. Let's look at how the expression for angle of devi um, deviation in Anna refraction. Angle of deviation under refraction of light. So this is the refracted ray. This ray is expected to go straight. The incidence ray is expected to go, but due to difference in densities of the two media, it is its part changes. Okay, so I'm supposed to go straight, but something has changed my path, and there is it. This angle here becomes the angle of deviation. But by vertically opposite reasons, we can see that I must be equal to R plus sigma. When you make sigma the subject, then I, sigma is equal to I minus R. This is the angle of deviation, angle of deviation when light moves from a less dense medium to a more dense medium. So that's the angle of deviation when light moves from a less dense medium to a more uh, a less a less dense medium to a more dense medium. Now let's come look at this one too. When the light is moving from a more dense medium to a less dense medium, how do we find an expression for the angle of deviation? So the light, the incident light is expected to move straight. However, due to a change in densities or difference in the densities of the two media, the path changes. So this, this angle becomes the angle of deviation, sigma. Meaning that when you look at what we have here carefully, I is equal to R, okay? I is equal to R. So it means that the whole angle of refraction, which is this, from the normal to the refracted ray, R, must be equal to this side. This whole angle is R, and this small one is I. So it means R is equal to I plus the deviation. So the deviation is equal to R minus I. This is the expression for the angle of deviation when light moves from a more dense medium into a less dense medium. Please, I hope that is understood. So expression for angle of deviation when light moves from a more dense medium to a less dense 
medium. So it isn't the same expression, but when you understand how they relate, you can easily calculate for it. All right. Let's talk about applications of refraction. Applications of how is the concept of refraction of light used in everyday life? How how do we use being it application by humans or nature? So applications where in which phenomenon do you see refraction of light occurring? Applications of refraction. Yes, let me hear from you. Yeah. What are some of the applications of refraction? Mami, mami, yeah. When you go to the pool uh -huh. and just looking at the pool of water, sometimes the base, the ground of the pool that the cows appear to be closer than they actually are. But when you step inside, it goes deeper. Okay. So, um, apparent displacement in of objects it's it's not only about the pool but when you have a, a bowl of water basin of water or when you have a pool swimming pool and then you drop something under it at sunny days when you look below it's always up the objects dropped in the pool appears to be closer than it really is. Growing up, whenever we visited the river or the pond and you look through it, you and then uh, you happen to see fishes. The fishes always appear to be closer to you. The moment you attempt catching it, you are swept because what you are seeing is a virtual situation, optical illusion. So you are seeing it to be closer, but in 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 actual sense, the distance you see is larger. Okay. So pool visiting the swimming pool in what afternoon? You look below it and you think, oh, it's just shallow. But in real in reality, it's a bit deeper than what you see. It's an optical illusion caused by a refraction of light. Thank you. Another application of refraction. More views. Mamiya again. Oh, please, the rest of you speak. It's an everyday thing we, we see around. Yes. Mamiya, go ahead. Mamiya, I'm listening. A river, go ahead. Mr. Edia, please. It is used in the formation of mirages. Mirage. Yes. A river, do you know what a mirage is? Yes, please. What is it? Please, it is when, like, the image of the sky appears to form a pool of water on the ground. Thank you. Thank you. So whenever you are driving or walking in a hot afternoon on the road and you happen to look afar, okay, it always appears to be a pool of water ahead of you. You move, you drive, drive. In fact, as you as you move to catch what you see as a pool of water, the further it goes. So you will never, never catch a mirage. 
and those who have had a sojourn on the desert has it that you see on the desert there is no water so they they say that whenever you are moving on the desert in 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 what afternoon you and then you happen to look ahead okay there always appears to be a pool of water ahead of you and you see on the desert because of the intensity of the sun the temperature is so high that you they will always want water to quench their thirst so seeing a pool of water there makes them feel like there's water they'll run 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 and will never catch that um, apparent pool of water and so you will never never catch a mirage that is a mirage which is an optical illusion more of you this is an um an a natural occurrence due to a mirage mommy i'm sure there's no room for but it's you oh my the guys please think through and share something with me okay mommy i go ahead Mommy, are your hand is apple. Sir, please, is Nana Kwame. Yo, Nana Kwame, go ahead. Sir, please, when you put straw in a glass of water, it looks bent. Bent, yes. Either a straw or pen or pencil. Thank you. So, whenever you put a stick, a straw, a pen, pencil, in water, a cup of water, and just you look at the surface, it always appears bent at the at the interface between air and water. What you see is an optical illusion caused by refraction of light. Thank you. So please take note of applications of refraction. Then let me add another. You see, we see as a result of refraction. So the operation of the human eye, the operation of the camera, the operation of the telescope, um, glass periscope, binoculars, optical instruments work on the principle of refraction. Mami, uh, is your hand up? No, please. Hey, your hand is always up here. Okay, Nathaniel. Nathaniel. Sir, please, the driving mirror. Sir, please, the driving mirror on the side of the car. Uh, Nathaniel, uh, nicely attempted. But you see, mirrors reflect. Whether plain or curved, for mirrors, they will always reflect because one side is coated. Okay? Mirrors do not exhibit refraction. They will always reflect. Okay. Nana Kwame. Sir, please. Formation of rainbows. Formation of rainbow. Yes, you are right. But for, for rainbow, it's it applies double characteristics of light. Rainbows go through reflection and refraction. Okay, so for formation of rainbow, it exhibits both reflection of light and refraction of light. Nathaniel, is your hand still up? All right, so, okay, Nanadwa. Say please in telescopes. Yeah. Yes, in telescopes, astronomical telescopes. So, optical instruments. You see, optical, even in your reading glasses, those of you, okay, who use glasses, the operation of, uh, of it applies the principle of refraction. Lenses, lenses refract, prisms refract. So, glasses, camera, Telescopes, that's why I said astronomical telescopes, binoculars, 
Prism Periscope, not the light periscope. Prism Periscopes all operate on the principle of refraction. All right. Let's then look at laws of reflection. Laws of reflection. Laws of Did I say reflection? Laws of refraction of light. The, the first law is similar to the first law of reflection. Okay. And Leonard, help me uh, to discuss the first law of Reflection. What is the first law of reflection, Leonard? Leonard, you are here, so help me discuss the first law of reflection, not refraction. Okay, Nathaniel. Nathaniel, help me out. Leonard isn't a attentive. Nathaniel, what is the first law of reflection? Oh, please don't waste time. Don't waste time. Okay, to any one of you. To any one of you. What is the first law of reflection? Please, the, the incidence ray, reflected ray and normal all lie on the same thing. So... The incident ray, the reflected ray, the normal to the point of incidence all lie in the same plane. The first law of refraction is similar to this first law of reflection. So Nanadwa, help me craft something for the first law of refraction. Nanadwa. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Help me create something for the first law of refraction. Okay, Nanadra, Nana Kwame wants to answer. Nana Kwame. Sir, mm -hmm. please, can you say that the incident ray is opposite from the refracted ray? You see, this is. Two dimensional drawing, you can't see it, but when it is about 3D, real world situation is not like that. Okay. 3D from 2D, that is what it appears from the drawing. But in real world practical situation, it's just similar to the first law of reflection. That's the incident ray. The law says that the incident ray, ray, the refracted, the refracted ray, this time not reflected, refracted ray, and the normal. at the point of incidence incidence lie in the same plane so it's very very similar to the only difference is that reflected ray is changed to refracted ray okay <laughs> I want to take an argument on that. Okay. All right. Then the second law. The second law of um refraction. It's known to be Snell's law. 
Please not snail so. Snail's law. What is the snail's law? What is the snail's law? This law is named after one Austrian physicist by name Willy Broad Snell. Willy Broad Snell. Willy Broad Snell. And the law says that for any two pair, for any two pair of media, or for any two different material of different densities or optical densities. Example, this is a ray of light moving from water to air. For any pair of media of two different densities, the ratio so for any pair of material or media of different optical densities, optical densities, the ratio the ratio of the sign of the angle of incidence incidence to the sign of the angle of of refraction is equal to a constant is equal to to a constant so for any pair of material of different optical densities the ratio of the sine of the angle of incidence to the sine of the angle of refraction is equal to a constant. So this is, I is the angle of incidence, R is the angle of refraction. Snell's law mathematically here is, is that sine of angle of incidence I over sine of angle of refraction R is equal to a constant. This is the second law of refraction. For any two or for any pair of material of different optical densities, the ratio of the sine of the angle of incidence to the sine of the angle of refraction is equal to a constant. This is Snell's law. Please, any question? Any no, question? Okay. And this constant K, this constant K or constant can be represented by any letter, but you need to define S what we term or is equal to the refractive index. Refractive index of the material. By which material? Of the denser material or medium. The refractive index of the denser or the material. Okay, we will, we will go through refractive indices and you understand why 
we relate this, okay? And in this case, let me clarify this. So the refractive index sine i over sine r is actually the, um, the uh, absolute or refractive index of the denser material. Here, we are always comparing um, two different material where one is air and one is a denser material. So we are comparing the material's refractive index to air. I will expand this for you to understand it very well next week. Please, any question? Any question? No, no, please. Okay, so if you don't have any question, please, those of you who owe me assignments, Eva, Angel, the rest of you, everybody. <laughs> Cedric, okay, you submitted yours. Please, I'm expecting your follow-up, okay, so that I include your name. Nathaniel, did you send yours? Rachel, Rashid, Rashid, Kofi, uh, I say, Yara, I'll be waiting for you. So this is where I draw the curtains on today's meeting. Thanks for your time, your everything, your silence, and your uh, non-contributing uh, 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 posture or attitude. Those of you who contributed, thank you so much. We'll continue on next week. May the good Lord be with you. And in fact, Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> bye. Right. Okay. Bye. All right.